All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. My name is Lindsay Walsh, and I serve as the Assistant Director of the Vantage Point at Mary Baldwin University. So as the Office of Personal and Professional Development, we have been trying to host these events called Let's Do Lunch. Um, in non-COVID times, we invite these wonderful folks onto our campus, and we just have information about the internships or the jobs that they represent in Hunt Dining Hall, so you can pick up some info as you drive through. Um, but in our virtual world, we have been asking these folks just a couple questions about how they've reached uh, where they are in their career and any advice they have for our students. So with that, I'm going to let our three panelists to help represent the College of Visual and Performing Arts introduce themselves today. Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy Anderson, and I am a new dance professor here at uh, Mary Baldwin, and uh, I'm really excited to be uh, taking a closer look at our department and um, and building it uh, in a modern and exciting way. So we'll talk about that soon. Oh, I'll go. I don't know if everybody can hear me. Um, my name is David Verde. I'm a, uh, a filmmaker. Uh, I own a uh, production company here in Stanton. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, filmmaker guy. Uh, my name is Ben Leonard. I am the uh, general manager and uh, the program director for WQSB here in Stanton 106.3. We are Stanton's only independent uh, community radio station. and. Um, Happy to be here. Thanks, Lindsay, for having me. Yes, welcome. And students, I am going to drop a shared document in the chat here momentarily, and it will have everyone's bio as well as a link to a website representing uh, where they're representing today and their email in case you want to follow up afterwards. And if you just want to chat your name, your major, and what you hope to learn today, that would be awesome. So. Let's launch into these questions. You know, just an easy one here. So how did you all end up in your respective career? Was there a clear path or a variety of experiences that have brought you where you are today? Should I start? Absolutely. Yeah, go for it. All right. Um, well, I my career uh, is uh, I'm a musical theater actress and dance singer, dancer, actress, and I've spent the last 25 years uh, performing on and off Broadway and on uh, theaters in the regions and as well as over in London and even China. And um, uh, I would say that a career in theater is um, somewhat intuitive in that it's there's not a straight line but you just keep following your nose and following your opportunities. And uh, if you keep um, if you keep saying yes to opportunity, uh, interesting things happen. Um, I I think that my my initial path was very unexpected um, because uh, I was in a situation in my undergraduate where, due to family finances, I was unable to finish my undergraduate degree, and right at that same time I was presented with an opportunity to do a show in New York City. Uh, so I, I took a bus down to New York from Boston. I grew up in Boston and I was in school there and um, I took a bus down to Boston on a Friday, I mean down to New York on a Friday with armed with a monologue and a song and uh, a resume and a headshot and by Monday I was in rehearsal for an off-off Broadway show at uh, La, the famed La Mama uh, uh, alternative uh, theater of the day and uh, so I was off and you know in New York uh, especially at that time all you had to do was get a, a, this magazine called Backstage where all the auditions were listed and so I um, I just started going to auditions and luckily started booking things and started working, getting to know people and continuing to work. So. Cool. I'll go if that's cool. I feel weird with this microphone way down here. Uh, so I'm going to reference the question. Uh, my career was not very straight line. I kind of like loopity looped. Um, I grew up being fairly creative to begin with. Uh, I've 
done photography in some shape of videography basically since I was a, a teenager. Um, but uh, college wasn't necessarily an option for me when I immediately graduated from high school. So I did uh, join the military, I joined the Air Force, and I was intended to be in broadcast. Oddly enough, I was going to be a radio DJ was, uh, at the time. Um, unnecessary story of how that didn't work out. Something about I wasn't born in America. Um, <laughs> true, it's a, you have to have your citizenship uh, to have the proper clearance. So I ended up uh, getting a job that was um, very uh, eye-opening. It was a very labor-intensive job and not creative at all. So uh, when my enlistment concluded, I freelanced. And, uh, and freelancing, basically working along a lot of people, um, I, I was fortunate enough to work in publications and for, for uh, media outlets that were willing to give me lots of opportunity to essentially apprentice under extremely seasoned um, professionals who did have that educational background um, and working along personal projects. And it sort of was this slow burn to eventually figure it out actually how to make a living never mm -hmm. living in a major market. And I think that's really kind of, for me as a filmmaker, that's like what I always like to share, share with, with folks. Is, uh, I haven't, I've never, never based in Los Angeles. I was never based in New York City. Um, so it's always been about figuring out how to work parallel or as close as possible to some of those larger um, projects that you would be fortunate to work on being based in those places and never actually committing to that uh, decision. Um, but anyways, but that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, I was, I uh, kind of got to where I am uh, definitely through a variety of experiences. I grew up here in Stanton. Uh, I've been playing music since I was uh, 15, I believe is when I first got my first instrument, an electric bass, and uh, just fell in love with, with, with uh, playing music. And uh, since I was, uh, 10 years old, probably, I wanted to be a DJ. I remember telling my eighth grade guidance counselor that I wanted to be a DJ for a career, and she kind of laughed at me. Um, and that was the end of that. Uh, until I went to James Madison for um, about a year and a half, and I was involved in uh, WXJM up there. Uh, it's kind of a grunt. I, I was, uh, I had a, a, a brief show from 3 to 6 a.m. That was the first slot that they would give me since I was just a freshman and uh, not that important. But um, it definitely kind of whet my appetite for, for radio. Uh, and then I went to school up in Boston. Uh, Nancy, I went to Berkeley up there. Oh, and, I, went, uh, I went to New England Conservatory right up the road. Oh, yeah. I, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I had a lot of friends that went to NEC. We used to go down there and hang out a lot. Um, played in bands in and around Boston. I played in orchestra pits uh, for performances in, uh, at UVA and at the Heritage Repertory Theater in Charlottesville. So. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd always kind of been involved in the performing arts that way, um, you know, through music. And a few years ago, uh, I ended up meeting Tom, who was the previous general manager at WQSV, uh, and um, started talking to him. And uh, I had always been afraid of speaking in public. And um, I just had this fear of public speaking. And I kind of remember back to my eighth grade guidance counselor chat about when to be on the radio and uh, decided to just give it a shot. And, uh, you know, through volunteering and kind of helping out with the station, uh, he ended up leaving last summer and uh, asked me to kind of take over the role. So I was happy to, and uh, it's been really exciting so far. And uh, it's just really cool to, to be exposed to a lot of opportunities that, um, you know, wouldn't necessarily have happened uh, if, if the station weren't around here in Stanton. Uh, I think it's a really special thing that we have here, and uh, I want to make the most out of it. Well, it sounds like uh, persistence is key in the arts, is what I kind of pulled from all of your stories there. So uh, definitely making some network connections, and even if your eighth grade guidance counselor has, you know, kind of turned their nose up at it, doesn't mean it's not worth pursuing. So. All right, folks, next question. Our students have asked if there are any books you would suggest that they read, um, and I'll expand it also if there's any websites, um, any blogs, basically any information that they can follow along to get more insights into your industry. Hi, uh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, 
I, if, if you want to be an actor, I think reading any book that is um, about acting, if any book that is particularly, I like biographies. I like to read a lot of different biographies to understand the, um, to recognize that there are many different paths. And I think that, I guess I, I stall at the question because I think that when it comes to the arts, whether it's music or dance or, or movies or <laughs> theater, um, uh, I think that in college, you tend to want to believe that there's going to be a rule book, that there's going to be a list of, of steps that you can take. And if I check off all of the things on this list, then I will be a Broadway star. And, um, and I uh, am in the business of, um, of obliterating the rule book. <laughs> I, I really think that there are uh, as many different people there are in the world, that's as many paths as there are to, um, to pursuing your dreams and um, and the minute that you can think outside of the um, of, of the checklist you're going to start really thinking more creatively as to how to achieve what you want and 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 the most important thing you can do is get yourself in the mix uh, whether that means um, taking auditions or uh, or getting an internship at a radio station, or you know, do, doing whatever it takes to get yourself in the middle of it. In my case, I was virtually jettisoned into the middle of New York City, and and figured it out, and um, and I just started showing up at the auditions. So I think that that br being brave is the number one um, piece of advice I can give. That if you can get those voices of doubt out of the way and just try make that phone call, uh, um, move to that city if that's the city you want to go to, um, knock on the door of somebody you want to work with. Uh, I think that that's useful. Um, as far as books, um, I think that it, w these days in college, um, when you get into a college track, an artistic track, you tend to narrow down very quickly. and. Um, I'm a big fan, and, and Whitney will uh, attest to this, who's in my dance class. Like, I'm a big fan in exploring all of the facets of whatever subject, subject you're interested in and things that are totally unrelated because to make interesting art, you have to be an interesting person. And even if you're a dancer, you have to be an interesting person. And so you have to, um, you have to educate yourself. And it doesn't mean that you have to have uh, all the formal education in the world, but you sure as heck should be reading books and watching documentaries and 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 learning about the world so that when somebody asks you to in my case i was asked to sing at a um, convention for world science and it just so happened that i was also a geological sciences major in college and so I thought that uh, singing at a world science convention was a really good idea and had to sing a bunch of science tunes and had to really understand the science in order to sing the songs that were about, you know, that were, uh, uh, that had subjects per that pertain to science. So you, you never know when you're going to be on a, on a TV show where you have to play a doctor and deliver a string of um, technical terms and actually sound like you know what you're talking about. So when it comes to books, the, my advice is read all of them. <laughs> Cool. I'll jump in next. Um, so uh, for for film and cinematography, uh, the 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 man. So the internet is is kind of this endless pit of of knowledge, and I, I use that word loosely. Um, you know, you you'll go on on YouTube or, or blogs and stuff, and and often you're having people who are workshopping information that they're learning in real time. And so I think it's a great place to start, you know, the internet, obviously, because it's free. Uh, and if you're in the visual media, you know, YouTube is, I guess, a, a useful tool. Um, I, I will admit that I use it sometimes to learn how to navigate the extremely complex and confusing and sometimes really poorly designed menu systems on all the different cameras that I use. Um, but uh, that said, uh, the majority of the people who, in my opinion, who give knowledge on the internet um, are kind of 
sharing knowledge that's been regurgitated a gazillion times by people that are making a very specific genre, and that is internet content, um, which isn't a good, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But just so you know, the internet, um, take it with a grain of salt. My opinion is, is uh, you you should digest, you know, with within film and cinematography, you should digest a lot of media. Um, you know, my background before I really started taking film seriously, or I guess necessarily was paying attention to what I was doing was photojournalism. That's what I was doing. I was doing editorial work and I was doing photojournalism, you know, like running out there and doing stories. So it made me extremely good at observational work. Um, but that's probably another question. But as far as books go, um, the first book I'm going to recommend, which oddly enough piggybacks on uh, on what Nancy said was uh, the the complete dinosaur. Uh, pick your volume, uh, but the complete dinosaur is one of the primary reads for um, students of paleontology, and and <laughs> and the reason why I suggest that is because it it has nothing to do with the field, but everything that you thought that you were taught about dinosaurs when you were growing up in elementary school or in high school, you you get this like brutal reality check, and it's a really complex science that was evolved from lots of places that you wouldn't expect. Uh, you know, I think there's lots of other scientists, um, um, astrophysics and uh, astronomy has roots in people that were trying to uh, prove certain religious uh, things and then they were getting burned because they were saying that things were otherwise that the uh, priests or whomever the hierarchy of the religious groups were not agreeing with. Um, but, uh, paleontology, oddly enough, is kind of a similar field. And so you get to, you get to really evolve in these stories. Um, and it's kind of this interesting thing that is very relevant to when you're creating, uh, be it fiction or nonfiction, or you're working in, uh, journalism or a documentary film, you're getting information and you're getting these, uh, um, uh, like, I can't think of the word, but you know, it's, it's this, uh, uh oh, like curveball. you know, where did that come from? How did... How did that happen? And now all of a sudden you're learning about how that became science. But as far as film related, uh, like I said, Complete Dinosaur, it's a great book. I like dinosaurs, dinosaurs are cool. Unrelated to film, but I think it's a very enlightening read and it's it's really long and it looks cool in your bookshelf. Um, the, the books related to film, um, one I would suggest is called um, In the Blink of the Eye, I think it's correct. In the Blink of an Eye, In the Blink of an Eye. Anyways, um, it's... Um, it's a it's a it's a book directly about filming, specifically filming back in the day when like they were actually using scissors and cutting film, um, and and talking about where places feel most organic and natural to edit. And I think uh, there's that's a really great place to start. You know, I have a musical background. You know, I again very strange. Try, thought I was going to be a music major. Thought I was going to be a radio DJ. Um, so I have musical backgrounds and it, there's, there's nuances to editing to that, but there's some fundamentals if you're talking about editing, um, before putting any fluff or nonsense on top of it, that kind of distracts the viewer's experience. Um, editing at its core is, is something about pace and finding a, finding the way it edits. So that's a really good book I would suggest. The other book I think is a really great book is called Rebel Without a Crew. It's a play on Rebel Without a Cause. Um, if you're familiar with that, uh, but <laughs> Rebel Without a Crew, I think is probably my personal favorite book because it's about a dude who didn't have any crew. He was basically by himself and he's like, Hey, I'm going to make this film. How do I do it? And he's going to do it by itself. And, um, and I think it's a really enlightening thing to read someone who decided to pursue this, you know, cinematic production, uh, with basically nothing. Um, and I think that's really good to know because uh, you can't do it alone, but when you have to, sometimes that's what you got to do. So I think those two books, uh, so In the Blink of an Eye and Rebel Without a Crew and The Complete Dinosaur would be three books I would recommend. Uh, I would recommend, I'm kind of split between two um, that I think have been really important to me. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I didn't uh, have any kind of uh, schooling or anything in broadcasting. Uh, my background is in music and uh, film scoring. Um, and when I was in school, um, and David, you might actually be familiar with this, uh, Igor Stravinsky, the composer, uh, wrote a book called The Poetics of Music. And uh, if you're not studying music, there's probably a lot that you'll kind of gloss over. There's a lot of technical stuff. But he did talk about the importance of 
uh, imposing limits, imposing restrictions on yourself in order to kind of uh, channel your focus. If you have this canvas where you have uh, just an infinite number of possibilities, and textures, and sounds, and uh, it's it really overwhelming. And it was something I struggled with a lot. Um, and it, that, that book really made a difference to me as far as uh, helping me kind of uh, focus on what I was doing uh, and, and kind of applying that principle uh, to everything, really. Um, the other book I would recommend, it came out recently, uh, and I thought it was wonderful. It was, uh, it's called uh, Humankind, A Hopeful History. It's by uh, a historian named Rutger Bregman. And uh, he talks about how, you know, all throughout uh, humankind, there's been this kind of principle that humans are um, savages and that without society and uh, structure, uh, we would just kind of resort to the hunter-gatherer days where uh, we'd be killing each other and it'd be every, every, everyone out for themselves. And uh, he just illustrates countless examples where that's just not true. Um, and it really uh, is kind of an eye-opening, uh, you know, if, if you want to try to think optimistically about your place in the world and um, kind of where you fit in and kind of how you interact with, with society. Uh, you know, it talks about how, how cynicism is uh, basically just another word for laziness. Um, you know, you, you, if you're cynical and pessimistic, um, you automatically give yourself a way out to not engage and not take any responsibility for yourself and for others. Um, it was really eye-opening, and, and I really enjoyed it. I would highly recommend that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a book you can apply to, like, like the other ones, uh, just to kind of um, all aspects of your life, uh, just thinking positively and uh, optimistically, because uh, that's really kind of how the world does work. And uh, you, you really shouldn't buy into the whole concept or the whole theory that, uh, you know, everyone's out for themselves. Uh, that's just not, not true. But, yeah, those would be the two I would recommend. So, as expected, um, a very eclectic but well-read group here in the arts. So, anything and everything is Nancy's recommendation. You know, I could also I could also say for the dancers in the group, the dance book that had the most influence on me was Dance to the Piper by Agnes DeMille, the great uh, Broadway choreographer, who was also uh, grew up in early Hollywood. So her she was the niece of um, of uh, Cecil B. DeMille, and so she's got a very interesting backstory and a very interesting approach to the arts. So that's a technical book about dance that I think is a good one. <laughs> So hopefully you can use it to choreograph the science cabaret that Dr. Mitzer has suggested. <laughs> and I mean, I would attend that. That sounds interesting, right? Like dances with cadavers or something. Yeah, there's, there's, they definitely exist. There's certainly a playwriting contest that has to do with science. <laughs> That's awesome. So, but again, that was more than one science recommendation. You know, like you were talking about your performance with some of those words. David recommended dinosaurs. I'm diving deeper into music with um, Igor. I'm going to butcher his last name, but the book recommended by Ben and then the dance Stravinsky. book. There we go. Thank you, sir. Stravinsky. Sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, and great chat links here. Um, thank you, Professor Menzer, for keeping up with that. So a um, little piece of advice for our aspiring art professionals. What is your advice for someone breaking into the performing and visual arts world? How do I get to work with limited experience so far? Uh, move, move to a major market if you're trying to get in the film. Um, that would be and and either survive or get chewed up and spit out and take everything that you learned while you were there. Um, I did mention that I've never lived in a major market, but I did. Uh, uh, frequently work in New York when I was working in fashion. Um, there's some work in, of my old work on my wall here somewhere in my office. Um, but it was a, a good reality check. So um, you learn lots of soft skills uh, and, and you also really learn how, um, um, how small these industries get when you are in them at that level and especially within those, uh, those markets. Uh, 
um, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon is a real thing. Uh, everybody, everybody knows somebody somehow. And so it's really good to know not to, uh, to, to, before you start trash talking people, um, I may or may not be speaking from experience here, uh, to know who you're trash talking about to whom, uh, so that way it doesn't get back to them and then you get blacklisted. I never got blacklisted just so you know, but I know, um, <laughs> it would have happened probably if I wasn't careful, if I would have stayed working in that game. Um, but, uh, um, I think, you know, the two biggest things, I, I work with a lot of young aspiring people who reach out to me and they want to like assist for me on, on projects. And, and uh, the, the biggest thing for, for film is, is, is humility. You know, a lot of, a lot of young people have experience working with, you know, like really modern cameras that are affordable and accessible. Um, and they may have like filmed weddings or events and stuff. And, and then all of a sudden you're coming on a crew, whether it's a three, four person crew or a 10 to 15 person crew. And, um, if you don't have uh, uh, the ability to downsize your uh, uh, your your ego to realize now you're working at a you know amongst a machine, um, you know that that would be uh, that's a crucial step that I think you need to figure out. And and my comment about working in a major market is that there's far more opportunities for you to go on to uh, production working as as an assistant, like the like a production assistant at the lowest of the low um, in those places. You know, and you can do that in other places. You can do it in Washington, D.C. There's a large uh, industry there in Virginia. There's, oddly enough, there's a thriving uh, uh, film community uh, from small scale all the way up to national and international productions in the Richmond and Virginia Beach area. Um, so you can go to, I mean, Atlanta. Atlanta is becoming one of the most prominent markets in the South for film. So, you know, whether or not you choose to live there long term, maybe finding a way to get those opportunities is, is one good way. Um, the other one I would say is uh, while you're trying to find opportunities uh, to gain experience is to just create your own. And um, that's kind of what I like to always do. Uh, a lot of jobs that I've gotten is because I decided to make us the stupid decision to launch a project that was way above my head. Um, and even if it didn't succeed, I uh, made connections along the way. And all of a sudden, um, I'm working alongside other people on other things. And then, you know, pursuing other projects that are a little bit more substantially funded and, and backed uh, of my own. So creating your own opportunities is a really uh, good way. And then, like I said, uh, whether it's full time or just finding a way, whether it's an internship or, or finding some small network where you're, you know, you're just, you're just risking the the expense to gain some experience, you know, try to find a way to work in a larger market just for some time. If you want to work in film uh, in some capacity. And I think those will really afford you some really good life lessons that you'll be able to carry on to, to whatever your career evolves into. Um, I guess I could go next. Um, if you're, trying to well whether you're trying to do musical theater or dance uh, uh while you're in college there's a lot of summer programs that you can do there's um uncsa has a great summer dance program jacob's pillow has a great summer dance program you can contact me and we can uh, look into uh where you want to be and what kind of dance you're doing and and find uh summer opportunities um and the same is true with theater uh if you go to playbill.com or backstage.com, you can find auditions for um, summer theaters and um, all kinds of professional work, uh, student films, um, and a fair amount of dance company work um, through backstage. Uh, so you can either find a summer, uh, a summer training program for any of these things or summer work opportunities. And um, my advice is, is just try it, just uh, audition for it. Even if you have little experience with dance, it can be um, a little trickier depending on what kind of dance you want to do. You'll run into people who are far better trained. Um, but in both, in all uh, performing arts now, the, the, the rules have changed so much in terms of um, what, uh, what uh, the producers or directors are looking for. And you never know, you might ha just have that special something that people are looking for and want to um, hire you or take you on and mentor you to, uh, towards your goals. So um, I would say uh, find those, uh, look, look into Backstage and, um, and Playbill 
um, for theater and for dance, uh, start. I would start with the UNCSA and, and Jacob's Pillow and look from there to find the, the, those opportunities. Um, my advice besides practice, 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 um, would be to, uh, there's something, uh, Nancy, you said something earlier that kind of made me think of this. There's the, uh, this whole dichotomy of taste versus talent and, um, taste, at least in the, uh, broadcasting live events, um, music industries goes so far. If, uh, if you're ever unsure of your talent um don't be afraid to fall back on honing your taste um it really will uh open up a lot of opportunities and impress a lot of people if uh if you have good taste in music and the arts and kind of like nancy what you said uh, earlier um be an interesting person you know strive to to offer something that no one else has and um and again, yeah, I would say besides just honing your craft as best as you can, uh, don't discount taste because it really does go a long way um, in impressing people and uh, getting people to notice you. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I will say nothing is more refreshing when you're trying to talk the biz and then you just throw some random topic because you have nothing valuable to contribute to whatever they were talking about. And, and then you completely flip the conversation of this circle that you potentially weren't invited in to begin with, uh, because it turns out everybody would much rather talk about something that's going on that's relevant or something, you know, in the fashion world, you know, talking about music might have been a really quick way to get everybody to stop pretending that they cared about the cut of whatever they just saw at a fashion show. So, um, yeah, I agree. Be interesting. Yeah. And, and to that end, stay in touch with people. Like if you happen to, uh, if you see this panel and you reach out to one of us and ask our advice and actually listen to what we have to say, well, that makes us feel good. And then you stay in, <laughs> it's, it's always good to ask somebody for advice because you make that person feel really smart. Um, but, uh, but it's but the one thing I think the one mistake I made was not staying in contact, not assuming that this new friend you made might be able to remain your friend. And um, some some very influential people in the world, in particular, a producer, the producer of one of my first Broadway shows, um, uh, Roger Horchow, was a great, um, a very famous and wealthy businessman. And um, and he was actually featured in the tipping point in Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point uh, as one of these connectors, you know, and he uh, he's a hub. And and to talk to Roger Horchow, he's not a wheeler dealer operator like I'm making connections. He well, he uh, God rest his soul. He passed away last year, but he makes friends. And he not only makes friends, he keeps friends and he's just very good at uh, relating to other people, maintaining connections to those people. And I can't tell you how many times I have uh, not uh, stayed in contact with a, um, with a very interesting and exciting person I met si simply out of um, not feeling worthy or, not, or being a little embarrassed. And so uh, I've, I've been recommending to all of my students, like you meet somebody that is in a field that interests you, maybe you want to go into that field, stay in touch with that person. Shoot them an email every six months. Just check in, tell them what you're doing, ask them how they are. And you, you can't imagine how far that kind of um, f friendship um, maintaining will go. Agreed. My sister calls me Godzilla because when I burn a bridge, it's big. Um, but uh, I, I will agree, Nancy, I will, I will second that. And uh, the, maintain as many connections as possible as you have you know it, it they they i feel like everything in the arts is is uh is disposable unfortunately <laughs> so you know you never know when somebody might lose their job and you know or they move on to another project and and just kind of saying hi will be a connection uh, but on my godzilla comment don't be afraid to burn those bridges when those people completely go against your core values as a decent human being so that's be the only time I would recommend just go ahead and just like destroy that connection. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, be, make connections. Keep them. 
So great advice, y'all. It sounds like definitely being uh, of the hustle mentality and reaching out to people, keeping interesting tidbits and staying up with the industry. Um, and you've kind of already segued into the next question, which is what are some tips for approaching people that I want to talk to or work with? Um, so one thing Nancy mentioned was definitely maintaining those contacts, right? Every six months to a year, make sure you're just connecting with folks. Um, but if somebody in the audience wants to make a cold call or approach somebody, what are some tips that you guys have, um, either words to use or ways to do that? Uh, I would, if I could jump in, I would um, recommend trying to find a balance between, um, at least for me, um, confidence, but yet modest. Um, try and approach, or try and find an approach that works for you, where you come off as confident, but not arrogant. Um, and I, th I think at least for me and my receptiveness and what I've found uh, in others, I think that's um, the best tact uh, to, to take um, was to, be to find some uh, like a balance like that. Yeah, I, I, I'm sort of jumping off of that. I always say to be successful in, in performing arts, you have to have the the confidence the guts and, and the the ego to believe that you can be, be the best and the humility to know what you need to learn and to you need to have those in equal balance you have if you have too big an ego and you think you ha don't have that much to learn you're it's going to be hard for you if you um don't have enough confidence in what you can do and always think that you're behind the eight ball you might not have the confidence to um to uh to have the um, tenacity to um, pursue perf um, performing arts. Uh, but I would say um, uh, if, you're, if you're cold calling, if you're writing an email that you don't have any connection, well, sit back and think, why are you contacting this particular agent or casting director or whatever, you're, whatever the cold call has to do with? Um, what, it, what is the work that they did that attracts you to them to write them? And then, um, in fact, I was just speaking to a JMU, a gal that's graduating from JMU this year, um, who has miraculously taken every bit of advice I ever gave her. She said she wanted to do film and television. So I told her to do student films and create a reel. And she, within six months, she did that. And then I, I told her who to send it to, a couple of different places. She wanted to be on Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. She sent her reel into the casting at Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And I was on that show in a tiny, itty bitty part. So she dropped my name, which who knows if that mattered or not. I doubt it did. <laughs> but she was able to have a connection. She was able to say, my professor was on your show last year and said that I should send this in. She sent it in, then she called me and she said, well, I didn't hear anything, but I really wanna be on that show. And I thought, well, that's a long shot for her, but what the heck? I said, you know what? The truth about um, making, making a, a, a name for yourself in performing arts is how many times does that name, your name, cross somebody's desk? And you, you, have, to have, you have to create a, a, a scenario where, where you, you are um, always getting to the front of the getting to the top of their to-do list or getting to the front of the line of the things that they see so uh uh sidebar years ago when i changed to a new agent um they made me take the last three shows that i did this is back in the dark ages so i had to make a, an actual um uh review sheet so it said you know hardin curtis congratulates their client on her reviews for crazy for you and then i had these pictures and and review quotes and it was a show I'd done like three years before and I was instructed to send these um, these pub sort of marketing uh, emails or not emails snail mails to these ra uh, to these agents and my agent said do them send them out every two months so I dutifully sent them out every two months and by the end of six months all of these casting directors were pretending that they knew my work and they definitely did not because I was doing these shows in Utah and <laughs> Missouri and like places that they never would have gone. But this is so I translate that to the students I speak to now. This this gal that I was um, uh, advising at JMU, I said, well, what the heck? 
write them again, follow up and say, oh, I sent you uh, this, my materials a few months ago. I'm so interested in your show. I'm a great swing dancer. I see that you're doing this segment with the big band, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so she followed up maybe one or two other times. And sure enough, uh, they called her and she jumped in the car and went to New York and she got to be on Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And not only that, uh, she has such a, a, a camera friendly face that they asked her to do all kinds of special background work and stuff on it. And, then, and she's going to go up again. So, so that kind of maintaining, making sure your face, your name crosses somebody's desk at regular intervals, at some point, they recognize your name and they never know if they recognize it because you've sent them emails or whether they recognize it because you're you're somebody who other people know so it's a very interesting little game you can play with that yeah i agree on 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 consistency uh, without being a nuisance um you know and and i i, I forget if it was Ben or Nancy who said it, but you know, do do your research before you reach out to someone, and um, you know, try to figure out as much as you can about them, but also try to figure out what they're up to. You know, for uh, for filmmakers, you know, you know, we're often working on projects for nothing that we're trying to get the ball rolling on that eventually will have money, um, and so if you're able to maybe dig around and figure that out and, and, and this is like, there's a lot of creative fields that people are trying to figure out. So that way they can get to the point where they have the resources to, to do it full steam, but to try to figure out where they're at. And that way you can, uh, you can be very short. If, if it's a cold reach, you know, if you're reaching someone cold, like a cold call, you can say, Hey, I'm this person. I'm interested in this. I'm trying to get this experience. I have this skill uh you know maybe we could work together somehow um it, it in this in the same regard it's uh you know one of the things you'll have to figure out which is kind of up to you is uh how long you offer um offer your time uh that is not compensated because the uh, the long term goal i think for everybody in the arts is to make sure that we are promoting this uh, this very strange field that a lot of people, basically all of humanity gains value from and enjoy uh, to make sure they value it. And there's a lot of devaluing of it. So in your early years, you know, you may be finding ways to offer your time for nothing um, or for very little to eventually graduate to something that's more substantial. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, be persistent, be short, um, and, and maybe try to have already a solution in hand when you reach out. So that way that person is like, oh crap, I do need someone to pick me up coffee every morning at 9 a.m. in exactly. So, uh, whatever it may be, I don't know. It wouldn't be coffee. <laughs> I'd, well, I'd hope, I, I'd hope. <laughs> also to kind of piggyback off what David just said, um, make it easy for people, please. Um, not everybody expects everyone to be technologically inclined, but you know the more links you can put to uh, YouTube or whatever your wherever your work is, um, instead of some random uh, folder on some sketchy server somewhere that someone has to download, and um, you want to make it as easy as possible. Uh, the, the less hoops people have to jump through to, you know, in my case, hear your music, um, it, the the more inclined I am to, to check it out. For sure. Agreed. Wix is free. Wix.com. They're terrible at commercials, but you can make a website for free and it looks nice. <laughs> Just make a portfolio on the internet. It's, it's, it's super easy. That's great advice. So making sure that folks are reviewing their information and the you know value add that they have to offer ahead of time and making it easy for those folks to connect to it. Um, but it also sounds like you know keeping in touch with your network and maintaining a network that aligns with your values, right? Sometimes you got to Godzilla that bridge, but <laughs> in general, keep those folks that are around you. Um, definitely in touch and stay in touch with them and let them know the kinds of opportunities you're looking for and just make it easy to respond um, and figure out what talents you have to bring to the project. So, all right, so we have about 10 minutes left. I think we can squeeze in another question and then we'll share our favorite lunch. 
Um, so what sacrifices have you made to get where you are? I've already heard perhaps some time, <laughs> um, but any sacrifices you guys might have made along the way to get here? Just being content that I'm probably going to be poor for the rest of my life, but be okay with that. <laughs> um, that and, and lots of time, yeah, lots of and you know sleepless nights and uh, being rejected a lot. But that's yeah, poor lack of sleep, rejection. That's those are the sacrifices that I've made. So. I think. Uh... I've never, I think other people have seen them as sacrifices when I have not. Uh, uh, I know that my family members will say, gosh, all the sacrifices you've made, most likely because I missed all of their children's weddings. You're going to miss everybody's wedding, weddings. You're going to miss, you're going to, you're going to sacrifice, as, especially in my case, you've sacrificed a lot of holidays because in the performing arts, you're often, you are the holiday entertainment. So you don't get to have the holiday that everybody else does. And, um, but, uh, but it doesn't feel like sacrifice if you are obsessed and if you're not obsessed, you shouldn't do it. Um, it, it uh, that's what I believe. And I mean, of course I believe in obsession. I mean, I like, I like getting obsessed about cool information or cool perform, you know, I, as I, as I told my dance, uh, history class, I'm inviting them. I'm not asking them to work all that hard, but what I am inviting them to do is get really obsessed with these dances and get really interested in the cultures that make these dances, uh, and the, and the spiritual practices that are the impetus for these dances. It's all intensely interesting. Um, and so I approach my career the same way. I am intensely interested in all of the things I'm being asked to do. And quite frankly, I'm probably more interested in those things than I might be in somebody's wedding. <laughs> so, so those are the, you know, if you are somebody, however, um, uh, it's true, uh, you, if you, if you need to know where your next paycheck is coming from, that's going to be a sacrifice you have to make because you're not going to know. And, uh, and if, if you're, if maintaining your family holidays as they have always been is a, um, is something that's very important to you, you might have to sacrifice that kind of thing. Uh, but um, but it doesn't feel like sacrifice when um, when it's really fun. <laughs> yeah, I I would agree with that. I think obsession has so many negative connotations, but. Um, I'm, I'm obsessed with, with so many things. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm obsessed with uh, electronics and gardening, um, believe it or not, and, um, hiking and, uh, just music related stuff. And, and it kind of shifts and kind of comes and goes, but, um, I, I really think that it's a good, healthy thing to, to be really into something and, uh, to not be ashamed of that. Um, but yeah, otherwise I would say time and then kind of what David said, contentedness, you know, be prepared to, to give up whatever your notion is of normality or, um, comfort or, um, you know, that sort of thing. I, I think it'd be good to kind of temper your expectations a little bit and realize that, yeah, this is a really kind of tricky industry to navigate. And, uh, it's not a punch the clock nine to five stare to Excel spreadsheet all day type thing. Um, you know, that I've had 18 hour days for a full week working festivals and, um, it, I, I dread it going, leading up to it. But then when you're actually like in the swing of things and, and into it, it's just the most, most thrilling thing. Um, but you know, if, if, if I wanted to be content and, um, that wouldn't have happened and I wouldn't have had so many experiences because of that. So, uh, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, I guess you have to sacrifice your, you, you have to be ready to pick up and move. You definitely have to, to have to be mobile and flexible. Uh, so that's, that's an interesting aspect of that. Yeah. I, and I agree about the, the, the expectations of the conventional life. It, it's, it's non-existent and you have to be cool with it. And I'm really cool with it. Uh, I think New Year's Eve is pretty cool, and I like handing out candy on Halloween. Beyond that, birthdays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, all that stuff, and suck it, man. Like, I'd, I'd rather be working on something cool. 
uh, my, my family have gotten used to it. So they, they know I don't care. <laughs> they, know, they know I will cancel on them on a dime if something comes down my way. So it's just, yeah. <laughs> uh, just try to figure out ways to make it up and don't suck. You know, like if you have nephews or something or children. <laughs> So I think great um, information there, you know, especially if you're getting into the arts, a lot of the traditional holidays or expectations might go by the wayside and um, flexibility is definitely going to be key. Um, and it sounds like having some perseverance for those long hours, whether it's a filming or, you know, a performance season or a music show or festival that you're supporting, uh, you're definitely going to have to be able to make it go with some caffeine and some snacks to make it through that. So uh, speaking of snacks, we're coming to the end of our hour. So if you all can tell us your favorite place to get lunch, or maybe you're a chef and you make your own, and what is your favorite thing to eat? Uh, in all honesty, I am. I'm not a lunch person. I don't eat lunch because it makes me sleepy and um, I lose my energy for the rest of the day. So I usually skip lunch, but uh, if I need to meet up with someone somewhere in Stanton, uh, Baja Bean is just our go-to. Um, they're uh, great people. Sarah's a great person and she does so much and um, it's just kind of a no brainer. They're right down the street from us. So uh, I highly recommend Baja. Uh, my, uh, I would suggest uh, Gloria's, if you're in Stanton, Gloria's Pupuseria, mainly because it's food, it's El Salvadorian, I'm Honduran, but, you know, it's it's similar to food. We eat that stuff in Honduras as well, so. Uh, but if you ever go to Harrisonburg, uh, there's this uh, Korean joint called Mashita that I really recommend, but, um, but yeah, the uh, otherwise Stanton, Gloria's, get some, get some. Yeah, Glo uh, Gloria's is really good. Um, Chicano Boy is good, uh, but I like that new, I, uh, uh, I haven't been there too many times because our lives shut down uh, uh, right soon after it opened, but West Bev, is that what that place is called? Um, yeah, down on Beverly, that, and they have the sort of bowls with the rice and the salad and the grilled items. It's a pretty rockin' joint. Yeah, I heard it was good. Yeah. <laughs> Hooray. Did we lose our host? Hooray, Blackboard okay. Collaborate. Woo, she got bumped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we lost gone. our moderator. Well, it's so wonderful. Yep, she's Oh, gone. no, she left. <laughs> uh, I just stranded from her. She's having tech difficulties. I had to move everybody over to Zoom because that happens sometimes with Blackboard. She said her <laughs> computer's froze and she's trying to restart. Amazing. Well, should yeah. we thank everyone for coming? I think so. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Wendy. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you, everybody. For being here. Yeah, Great all of our team. emails are on there. You can email us yeah. questions. Yeah, contact us if you want to know anything. <laughs> hey, Paul. Okay, so this is from this is from Lindsay. She says, "Thank you all. Uh, she'll have the recording up by the end of the day." God, so sorry. <laughs> all right. <laughs> See you later, guys. Great lunch. Bye. It's nice meeting Bye. you guys. See ya. Bye. -bye.